Now, I believe there's a war on math, merit, and measurable metrics in our country right now. So let's discuss why this is happening, what it actually looks like, and what we can do about it. Now, I tend to focus on the challenges that we face with our government and the need to engage and be engaged if we're going to have any chance of confronting or addressing some of the problems that we face. Now, this is true at a local, state, and national level. But there are some basic trends that we should all be aware of as, as we kind of proceed down this path of activism and engagement if we have a goal of making a positive change. Now, if there are three things that our political class doesn't like, it appears to be the reality of math, the desirability of merit, and increasingly the measurable metrics by which we determine if our anointed leaders are doing a good job or even the right thing. Because they don't like these things, and all of them are under attack now in kind of a pretty widespread and aggressive manner. Now, I don't mean to leave out other key issues which our political leadership also despises. And yes, I'm talking about things like transparency, accountability, free speech, individual property rights, your money, your family, just common sense, reality, individual freedom and independence. Yep, they don't like those things either. But in this video, I'll focus on three less appreciated aspects of life which are currently being targeted in a very kind of pernicious and aggressive way. So let's start with math. Now, first of all, I expect most rational people to claim that they believe math is important. There are all kinds of great quotes out there about math. You know, here are a couple of examples, right? Math is the language of the universe. And math is the universal language. I like wherever you go in the world, the idea that two plus two still equals four, etc. And you can find all kinds of statements like that. However, math is also inconvenient. Math represents truth. And to our political leadership, the truth is often inconvenient for them, when, especially when the real priority is political power and the perceived narrative necessary to prolong that grip on power. For example, the political class really don't want people to realize just how out of control government spending is at the national level. They don't want you to realize that, uh, th that this is really out of control. They really want to convince you that it doesn't really matter. Nobody ever has to be paid back. Uh, this won't cause inflation. Or new theories like modern monetary theory, which isn't very modern. It's been around for a long time, but it has taken years of political assault on common sense and math to get otherwise semi-intelligent people to believe it's a good policy idea with no downside. Now, of course, this assault on math starts in the school system. Right now, in my home state of Washington, we're doing a very poor job ensuring basic math literacy in our public school educated kids. If we're extremely fortunate, maybe 40% of our kids are barely literate in math when they graduate from school. This is on our very, very low expectations that we already set. Now, our state isn't the worst. Some states are better and some are worse than we are. But none are stellar and there has been a severe slide from decades in the past. Now, unfortunately, dumbing down the math curriculum appears to be part of the solution for education insiders. Also, introducing esoteric experimental techniques found in common core curriculum, fuzzy math, or just plain brainwashing, it all seems to be part of the more extreme paths that we've seen educational insiders choose to take lately. Now, of course, now there's the inevitable fallback of math must be racist, and therefore, let's destroy it. I've never understood this approach because by its very claim, I believe that the people who pair at this talking point are being racist in the very foundation of their attack on math. However, when it comes to our political establishment, they benefit from this war on math, and many of them even promote it. When you're running deficits to the moon and printing cash faster than anyone ever has in human history before, you need to distract, uh, distract and confuse a population about the inevitable disaster that this is going to cause. So it's best to confuse them about the math, and you get away with this, the far less, the, the smaller a percentage, really, of people who are essentially math literate. Now, those who support big, bloated government, they tend to despise math because it has the potential to constrain their desire to grow. As Margaret Thatcher once famously said, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. Now, that's an obstacle if you want to bloat government. Our federal government overcomes this obstacle by printing trillions of dollars we don't really have and then just pretending inflation isn't real or that we can borrow money forever without paying any of it back. Or perhaps they want to use these mathematical tsunamis as the excuse to raise taxes higher, even though there's essentially not enough money in the nation to cover the tax burden that they envision. The war on math is real, and I suggest you make sure your kids learn math for real and don't rely on our failed education system to do it for you. Now, their priority, the education system's priority, is shifting to pronouns, sexual identity, making sure your kids are as unprepared as possible for the real world. 
you will do future generations a favor to ensure your children learn real math. Now, all is not lost either, by the way. I want to point out that even if kids are underserved by their failed education experience, many people do catch up later on in life. And admittedly, some do not, but many do, and I believe it is important to remember this fact. I've run into plenty of people who were pushed through the education system when were, were essentially illiterate when they graduated, and then for their own personal reasons, they decided to learn for themselves or they became truth seekers and taught themselves. Now, let's look at the war on merit. And in some ways, I see this as very related to the war on math. Once again, we're kind of seeing a very troubling trend at every level of our society to disregard merit. And this is a stunning reversal and a rejection of what was actually the progressive movement, which really began in the kind of late 1800s in this country. At that time, the idea was that if the people were given a fair shake at being taught and evaluated by their skills, then they could overcome many of the stratifications which our society um, had become a problem most people were concerned about at the time. Wealth, birth, and class hierarchies, they could be overcome by kind of this egalitarian merit-based approach. Into the early 1900s, and uh, even just up until a few years ago, this kind of meant that elite schools would open themselves up to the common people who could demonstrate their abilities via some type of merit-based testing. The concept of the SAT, the ACT, and other types of standardized testing was viewed as a way to overcome the historical prejudices which had once prevented poor people or religious ethnic minorities from fairly advancing in education, higher education, professional certification, or in other facets of life. Now, we also saw this in the civil service, which largely abandoned the patronage approach to government jobs, which it had had for probably close to 100 years, and now it shifted to a professional and presumably merit-based uh, advancement of the bureaucrat. Now, all that progress has been tossed aside onto the bonfire of the woke in an effort to promote this narrative and agenda that views merit as an obstacle to political power. This is still kind of a weird shift to me because, uh, but it's, you know, it's one that we must recognize because it's rapidly impacted every aspect of education and professional life. No longer are SAT scores required at Stanford, for example, and other schools. And this is despite the fact that Stanford, for instance, once prided itself on how many perfect SAT score applicants they rejected. No longer will the best grades or scores get, into the, get you into the college of your choice. In fact, they may not consider merit at all because it must, by default, be racist by design. Now, there have been shifts away from merit in magnet schools, uh, in middle schools, for example, in New York, um, with the decision that a lottery system now is a, somehow more equitable. Rolling the dice is better than earning your spot uh, with your skills and hard work. And I haven't seen my own state of Washington go completely down that path yet, but as the high-capacity student programs and honors programs are generally undermined and torpedoed, it seems like the hot, likely that the hostility to merit is going to be here as well. Now, related to this is the kind of bizarre, almost medieval or tribal way of describing people where the content of their character or their accomplishments takes this distant back seat to the color of their skin or who they sleep with. A few years ago, Washington State Governor Inslee appointed a new Washington State Supreme Court Justice. And nowhere in the press release issued by the governor at the time did he discuss the educational or experience qualifications of the new justice. Instead, the press release obsessed about the racial heritage and sexual partner preference of this judge. Now, this is just another example of the war on merit. Maybe this judicial appointee had an amazing legal mind and a stellar career of exceptionally impressive jurisprudence, jurisprudence in the past. Uh, but that didn't really matter to the governor. That's not, what he, uh, that's not why he appointed her. That's a problem. Now, of course, anyone who questions this war on merit will always be called a racist, sexist, homophobe as it always has been. When I was in college and an activist, we would combine all three of these words into just one word, racist, sex, homophobe, because it made it simpler to explain the kind of Tourette's-like response that those who war against merit have launched in the modern woke culture. You're not even allowed to question them. And this regressive, progressive tendency is only getting worse. Unfortunately, this means we're gonna have to start wondering if the people graduating from medical school engineering school or getting certified to do real jobs that actually require demonstrable skill with real world negative consequences for failure will no longer know if they really can do their job. Are they really capable? Are they even qualified? Will that doctor accidentally kill me in surgery because he never really passed the tests? Well, this may be the progressive worldview today. I doubt many of us would view this as progress. Now, finally, let's discuss the war on measurable metrics. And this has been an ongoing fight for those in charge of government and for those who support the bloat of big government for quite some time now. 
The problem with measurable metrics is that when the trends are going in the wrong direction, as they oftentimes do, it becomes harder to pretend that you're doing a great job. I mean, right now, most of the traditional corporate media, they're going to cover up the failures of government, provided that they agree with kind of the tribal political identification of those in charge. Republicans are bad. Progressive Democrats are good. It is simple, and nearly every mainstream reporter in America follows this script. And if they don't, they'll be canceled. So the narrative becomes more difficult to spin, however, when the measurable metrics are going the wrong way. So this applies to nearly everything. In my state of Washington, there are legions of examples like this, and I'm sure you can find tons where you live as well. And so here's just a, some classic examples. Say the Seattle City Council uh, wants to pretend that they care about public safety. But of course, their defund the police movement has not worked out very well. And the obvious metrics showing a decline in police officers, an increase in violent crime, and a general failure of every measurable statistic of public safety, is a, that's an inconvenient problem for them. It is hard to spin this in any kind of a positive narrative, so they want to change the stats, change how things are measured, or just stop tracking the information from the beginning. Another example would be Washington State's Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSPI. They want to pretend that they care about educating your kids, but when the collapsing test scores clearly indicate that they're failing at essentially the only job they have before them, then they want to water down the stats, change the inputs to falsify the statistics, or more recently, just stop collecting the stats in the first place. Some might even call this data racist, of course. And then this way, they can kind of have uh, uh, Democrat Representative Andy Billig from Spokane, for example, uh, has recently, he claimed that Washington State has the best public schools in the nation. And the traditional tame media, of course, they fail to call him out. Now, Andy Billig said this just a few weeks ago, and there's literally no measurable metric that would support that statement that he made. Washington State's not the worst, but we're far from the best. However, he wants this narrative out there so that he can justify flushing billions, billions more, down the unaccountable hole of education spending in Washington state. And remember, the narrative is what matters. That's the highest priority. Sure, we are spending far more than ever in our state, and we're getting far less for our tax dollars we waste, but that is also a metric that they don't want to measure. Another local example, uh, just from a few years ago in Thurston County, where I live, we were confronting both the Federal Fish and Wildlife Agency and the State Fish and Wildlife Department about their bizarre and ultimately successful effort to pretend that the pocket gopher was an endangered species. One of the major questions that we had first was, hey, how many gophers are there? How do you actually go about counting them? And finally, how many do they need to find before they consider this rodent no longer endangered? Now, this became a particularly significant question when we caught them falsifying the population counts, screwing up in the basic math for habitat set aside. Turns out uh, trigonom or, uh, geometry was quite difficult for them. And then lots of other classic fake and false accusations that were taken by this kind of general group that was pushing for this agenda. Now, in the end, they were forced to admit that they had no idea how many pocket gophers actually existed in Thurston County. They didn't care. There was no possible target population that would ever exist to convince them that this local rodent wasn't endangered. Remember, they knew that any measurable metric would expose their sloppy, slipshod kind of con game. And it was all about the money that they could grab. Didn't science, math, and reality were all inconvenient to the narrative, and they remain inconvenient to this day. Now, finally, we see this at the national level repeatedly. The federal government told us that we are not even in a recession, even though the standard definition of a recession and until last year had always been that two quarters of economic contraction, no longer. Can't have the scary word recession impact the election narrative. So of course the powers that be, in coordination with the tame media, they pretended that it never happened and all was economically well. Same with the efforts to manipulate uh, employment numbers or inflation measurements, modifying the statistics and how they measure those stats. When those in charge don't like the measurable metrics, they're going to find a way to change them, manipulate them, or just collect, pretend that collecting the data is too difficult so nobody can actually know the truth. And it's important for you to be aware of these games, and all of us need to be. Uh, we have a lot of fights over policy, transparency, and freedom and liberty issues to engage in this year and, and in future years. And when our political class decides their narrative is no longer served by the metrics that we've historically used to measure success or failures, they're certainly going to do anything they can to declare a war on those same metrics. Change the inputs, manipulate the data, or just pretend it no longer exists. And once you understand these things and this general war on math, merit, and measurable metrics that are waged by those who want to govern us, then I believe you can be empowered to push back, track data that matters, 
and restore the accountability that otherwise will vanish without us calling attention to it. And related to this, it's important to know our history on these issues. When someone argues that the math textbooks today are superior to the past, and then you show them examples of 100-year-old textbooks with clear evidence that the rigor of public education has changed, and not for the better, when silly and ignorant people like Representative Andy Billy pretends that Washington State's education system is the best in the nation, you have the data then to prove that he's laughably wrong. And when the measurable metrics used by government at any level start having their inputs falsified or modified or memory hold, you can take that data from the past and expose the con going on today. Don't presume the media is going to do this for you, because they won't. In fact, most traditional media outlets are colluding and coordinating with government most of the time to conceal many of these issues. In the end, it's going to be up to us to expose the truth. And by doing so, I believe that we can change the minds of those who are unaware of this war in our communities and for our future. I realize that our governing class wants to control us, they tax us, silence us, and keep us in the darkness of ignorance. But we can shake off these shackles by exposing the truth. Start local first. Pay attention to something that you know well. And work with others in your community. Really, you can't do this as an island or alone. Over time, with the facts and the truth, you can have an impact on what those who govern us are going to do. Now, I'll close with a request for you to look into your own community, the crime stats, the test results in your school, the budget in your city, or the grants in your county. Find the truth and share this with others. Find teams of others who care. Leave your comments below and let others know what you found. Only our, because really it's just our only other choice, right, is to do nothing, which simply ensures that the war on math, merit, and metrics prevails. And the false politically correct narrative is all that we have left. And I doubt anyone watching this video really wants that.